let me start recording first and we're going to pick it up from here all right so the last thing we talked about was was about um, doing hydraulic fracturing with multiple clusters in a single stage and so far we have assumed more or less planar fractures like these ones you see over here with a little more complexity than the ones we did over here but nonetheless uh, planar and you know this is more or less a, the simplest conception that we have uh, about ideal fractures but uh, there is data from the field that suggests that some of these fractures may be a lot more complex than what we think and there are several reasons for that so we're going to talk about those reasons now and not only the reasons but also the tool that we have available in order to predict this uh, complexity of fractures and that's going to be through micro seismicity whenever you do a hydraulic fracture in uh, the job let's imagine that uh, we fracture multiple clusters and we have main fractures still I'm going to conceptualize them like the ones I have over here let's say that at some point this is a top view and at some cro point you cross the fault this is the horizontal wellboard let me add a little bit of color to this and this is the top view we have evidence through micro seismicity that whenever we do hydraulic fracturing there is emission in the form of acoustic emission that comes from places close to the fracture and some other places not that close so what I'm drawing here now are the location of this micro seismicity events and this will be similar to uh, finding what is the hypocenter of an earthquake the guys in geology please help me when, when you come for depth is hypocenter or epicenter So hypocenter is accounting with with the uh, depth, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the ones that we are accounting for, and this is now just a 3D, I'm sorry, a 2D uh, a drawing. But imagine this cloud of micro seismic events in uh, in three dimensions. So all of these points then are small hypocenters of acoustic emission. And we call it micro seismicity because uh, usually the magnitude of these events it's uh, less than zero in the richer scale. What is the magnitude of a large earthquake in the richer scale? Right, seven, seven is pretty large, eight is, is very large. And remember it's a logarithmic scale so something of magnitude 8 is 10 times lower than something of magnitude uh, 7 okay so this micro seismicity is in the order of negative 3 negative 2 uh, negative 1 that would be a, a little bit large but it's a million times smaller than what you would expect for a medium earthquake do you remember what was the earthquake that was caused in Oklahoma, uh, the biggest one due to 
injection of water. It was close to five. I think it was something like 4.5. So it was, uh, it was significant. It was quite large. That was not micro anymore. And there is evidence that also in some hydraulic fracture completion, uh, especially uh, there are some places in Canada where magnitude of seismic events, it's not micro seismic anymore, got all the way up to four more or less. So that, that, that is pretty high. But in general, uh, we don't want to cause that such high seismicity. And uh, all this micro seismicity, if, if nothing goes wrong, it should go to values more or less below zero to the negative values. All right, so then can we think about what is the cause? of this acoustic uh, emission or uh, micro seismic emission. Well, first of all, let's talk about before the cause, wh what actually this is. So at each of these points, we are saying that there has been something that that's what we're going to investigate that created waves that travel to a geof geophone, which is located either on, surfa on surface or in observation wells that allows us to locate where they came from. And let me add one more thing. Sometimes also you can, according to the magnitude of, of the event, you can plot those events larger or, or smaller uh, according to, to its magnitude. So here, let's say that the size of the circle represents magnitude. All right, so what could be the reason of this acoustic emission from the earth when you're doing hydraulic fracturing? Fractures. What kind of fractures and what happens to the fractures? Shear, if you remember, we had three modes of opening or to uh, propagation of, of a fracture or reactivation of fracture. First one was open mode, and uh, then we have shear either in plane of or out of, of plane. Well, for, for the mode one, you can have a release of energy when you create new surface, but actually it's not much is going to come from that type of failure because there is not a lot of stored energy that you can release by, by doing this type of opening. Uh, of course, there is some energy release, but from the point of view of energy, there is no much that you can accumulate by putting something in tension because tensor strength is relatively small. And, and therefore, uh, probably there is not much that is gonna get out of there. Opposite, if you have a shear, either in plane or out of plane, you can, this is mode two, mode three, you can store a lot more energy in these two types when the surfaces are in contact with each other. So when the surfaces are in contact with each other and you start moving this, uh, applying force on the surface or stress on the surface, but it doesn't move, each time that you apply more and more stress, uh, that's, that stress, that energy is going to somewhere and it's getting accumulated as strain energy. Once that uh, you overcome the, the maximum friction coefficient, then everything is going to slide and all that energy is going to get released. And that's the same mechanism as for an earthquake. Uh, in earthquakes, you have faults that accumulate strain energy over time with the action of the tectonic plates and at some point they yield and it moves and uh, you release energy. So it's going to be mostly shear. 
all that comes from these micro seismic uh, events. And therefore, if this is all of shear, all shear, that means that these events are produced by mostly the reactivation of fractures or the creation of new uh, fractures. So reactivation of natural fractures or the creation of new uh, fractures in the subsurface. Probably when the rock is, where the rock is a little bit weak, then this is going to be higher. And again, the bigger the magnitude of the induced seismicity, the larger is the area that is going to be uh, reactivated in shear. And because of this, now this uh, also helps the hydraulic fracture network or connectivity to reach a little bit further uh, out of the main hydraulic fracture. There are some studies that show that if you were to have just a planar hydraulic fracture as the ones that we have shown, and you simulate reservoir production with the permeability of the matrix of shale, which is in the order of tens to hundreds of nanodarcies, it will be impossible to explain the production values that we get in the field. So the reason for that is that there is something else in there that helps fluids to move, not uh, from the matrix through some set of small fractures and to those small fractures then to a large fracture. And there are some studies that also show that doing a, an inverse analysis, for example, in the Barnett shell, they predict that in order to get the values that we see for production with the assuming a planar hydraulic fracture and the permeability of, of that you measure in the laboratory, this natural fracture should be spaced about one meter, more or less, from each other, which is relatively small. It's not, it's not that far. Okay, uh, let me continue this uh, figure and then I'll, I'll show you an example. Uh, do you have any questions? Let me tell you also that these microseismic clouds, sometimes some of the dispersion is real, but some of the dispersion also is, is fake in the sense that uh, it is quite difficult to locate some of these events and there is a lot of uncertainty in inverting what is a hypocenter. So if you don't do a good job in inverting your hypocenter, then uh, you may be also placing a micro seismicity where, where it, it is not in, uh, to begin with. It's just an, an error of, of location. And this is very useful because as you do each stage and you monitor this hydraulic fracturing job uh, on surface and with observation wells, you see how these regions around your stage sort of light up with micro seismicity. So it's very useful to see more or less where the effect of the hydraulic fracture uh, goes. And it's very useful too, we cannot see it in this uh, plot because it's a top view, but I also can tell you in height, if it stays in the region where you expect it to be, or if it goes down, or if it goes up. Sometimes you may not want to, for example, uh, go over a certain formation and uh, with micro seismicity, you can see if that effect and that fracture is going into there or not. Okay, so now, now I got to, to this point where I am going to start doing a fracture where there was a fault and I didn't see it. And I think that there is no fault. What do you think is gonna happen to this hydraulic fracture? as you reach a fault. Yes, and what else? 
OK, so as we go away from the fold, let's assume that the fracture more or less grows planar as we have assumed before. But if you hit the fold, then likely, depending on the orientation, this hydraulic fracture or the fluid may continue through the fold. But also, you're going to pressurize the fold. And if you pressurize the fold, instead of reactivating a small fracture, you're going to reactivate a large fault. So from here, now we're going to get significant induced seismicity from the plane of the fault that probably uh, that's something that you may not want to do. And some of the large hydraulic uh, induced seismicity observed during hydraulic fracturing is because you are hitting a fault that you were, you were not supposed to fault. So in that sense, it is very important to, to study what is uh, in the soft surface and map very well the fault so you do not do any hydraulic fracturing uh, that hits a fault. First, because you don't want to reactivate the fault. And second, because uh, you don't want your propants and your fluids to go into a fault. You want it to, to go into a region where uh, where when, where there is no fault, so you, re you reactivate or you stimulate the uh, rock matrix. Okay. So just to give you an idea, typical micro seismicity that we can measure with available technology uh, reactivates more or less fractures with a surface of a square meter. So, you know, if you take into account this, the sizes of typical hydraulic fracturing operation, that's relatively small. Uh, on the other hand, when you reactivate a fault, we you can reactivate something a lot larger, 100 square meters or, or more. Uh, and therefore, the magnitude that is going to, to come from that induced seismicity it is going to be a lot larger. Okay, so uh, let me finish one more thing. I forgot over here. Each micro seismic event then is going to be mostly the reactivation or creation of a new fracture in shear. And when that happens, you're going to create you're going to release a strain energy that is going to go in all directions in the form of elastic waves. P and S waves. So unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about uh, elastic waves, uh, but uh, um, if you are interested, I can point you in the right direction to, to learn a little bit more about, about this. Uh, let me see if I forget anything. Mm, I don't think so. So le let me show you a real example about this abstraction that we, we have done here. Um, for those of you really interested into micro seismicity, I recommend that you read this document. So if you go to my notes to problems, and if you go to this last link over there, you will be able, we're going to open it in a bit, but you're going to be able to read a very nice document about the fundamentals of uh, micro seismicity monitoring. And what we see over here, it's a real uh, hydraulic fracturing job you see with three wellbores and with micro seismic clouds that correspond to different stages. Each color corresponds to a different stage. So you more or less can see that for this first stage, this is the region of the micro seismic cloud. The second one, I believe, uh, is the green one. The third one is the blue. The fourth is the violet and blue, and so on. Uh, and these wells, uh, they are not in the same horizon. It's not the same depth, but they are a little bit staggered. One, I think in this case, the two ones from the sides were uh, higher, and the one in the middle was a little bit lower. 
and what you have over here it's a fault so in this case they could see the fault and they purposely concentrated most of the hydraulic fracturing around this area and not around the fault and not around any of these other faults because they did not want to reactivate reactivate those faults so let me go quickly to this document uh, this is a summary put together by by Schlumberger and it's part of this oil field review documents all of these documents are great if you find you know a document for the oil field review uh, for uh, any area that you're interested in, they're they are very good documents very well written and uh, I strongly recommend that that you read them if you're interested, especially this one about microseismicity. So again, what we were saying, uh, we have sensors in an observation well or sometimes on surface. Location of that microseismic activity, of the shape, as we were saying, ensure that hydraulic fracture your based on or below because otherwise you also you will be uh, wasting fluid and propane and, and here you have for example sometimes those observation wells can be also lateral wells or deviated wells that get closer uh, to the region of hydraulic fracturing and on surface too the closer you are to the hydraulic fracturing job the better it's going to be the location of centers of all of those and uh, these are the PNS waves and the microseismic cloud and I wanted to get here all right so what this plot suggests is that here in the x-axis you have the stimulated uh, reservoir volume and they call it ESV, I don't know why the E is, but the E is for, but uh, effective stimulated volume. I think that's what I mean here. Or usually it's, it's also known as SRV, stimulated reservoir volume. But the idea here is that the higher the amount of micro seismic events you see, and the bigger this cloud is, the bigger your stimulated reservoir volume is going to be, and therefore the bigger your production is going to be. So let me now come back to my notes. You could potentially use all of these microseismic data to delimit a, an assimilated reservoir volume. And, and this is very important because what we are thinking here uh, is that all of these shear fractures that have been reactivated during hydraulic fracturing now are going to contribute somehow to production. So the idea, as we were saying in the paper, is that The more micro seismic events you see, the higher is going to be the cumulative production. And what we were seeing in this previous paper is that in general, you might find a positive correlation between this. There are some people that suggest that all of the production in unconventional is due to this reactivation of natural fractures and um, and you know some other people think probably this is a big part of the of this I th I'm more on the side that this might be a big part but there are some other people that think that this all of it it comes from reactivation uh, of fractures um, I don't know if this was clear or not but I, I'm gonna say now why do we have reactivation because we have leak off of the main fracture into this network of fractures, pore pressure increases. As pore pressure increases, effective stress decreases. 
and as effective stress decrease, especially the normal effective stress, then we move our more circle closer to the failure envelope uh, for shear, and that's what produces the shear reactivation. So let me do it very quickly, uh, small here. What we are meaning is that if originally we have a shear envelope like this one, and we have a more circle somewhere over here in situ, once we do hydraulic fracturing, this one is going to tend to move to the left and is going to reactivate in shear. And as reactivates, some of these fractures would open up, will dilate, and that's going to uh, help uh, the overall conductivity of the hydraulic fracture. So now if we put all of this together, we can see that uh, hydraulic fracturing is not only open mode failure, but it's also shear mode because you have open mode on the main hydraulic fracture, but also you have shear failure around the hydraulic fracture that helps you uh, stimulate the reservoir volume and make it more permeable. Okay. Now with this conceptual idea, uh, let's try to see how sometimes this idea of accounting just for the simulated reservoir volume might fail. So in general, we said that we're going to find a positive correlation between SRV or amount of microsalcimate activity and total production. Well, there are some cases in which you have quite a bit of stimulated reservoir volume or micro seismic events, but your productivity is relatively low. Can you tell me what could be a reason for that? So, you know, you do hydraulic fracturing, run your micro seismicity, you see a lot of micro seismicity, you're very happy, you put the well to produce, and we're assuming the, there are hydrocarbons there, right? Uh, so hydrocarbon content is good, but little comes out. Are not staying open, uh, and if they are not staying open, why could that be? What keeps the fractures open? Propan, Propan right? So if they do not stay open, that's because you have unpropped fractures. And, uh, and that's not good uh, from the point, point of view of stimulation because you could create a lot of micro seismicity. But then if you don't have any propant, as soon as the effective stress starts, starts to increase again, the fracture is going to close and its conductivity, although it's going to be a lot larger than the one of the matrix, may decrease significantly with time and may close again. And at the end, if you don't have any propant in here, which is actually very, very difficult to, to put in, but you may get a little bit in these fractures. Uh, but when they close again, now you're just going to have this main hydraulic fracture that helps uh, production and not any of the initial uh, shear reactivated fractures. Uh, so let me, if you have unplugged fractures, the permeability of those fractures is going to be inversely proportional. Let me put here the logarithm of permeability of the fracture on the y-axis is going to be inversely proportional to the effective normal stress. So when the pore pressure decreases, effective normal stress is going to uh, decrease, increase, effective normal stress is going to increase, and 
and the permeability is going to go down. Okay, what could be a solution for prop some of these fractures? Let me tell you, sometimes it's very difficult because, you know, propan cannot be like a, the, a magic bullet that, you know, just turns one way and the other way and then just goes everywhere. Especially some of these shear reactivated fractures, if there is no dilation, they're not going to open up a lot. So probably you're not going to be able to get sand inside it because the thickness is going to be very small. Uh, but let's assume that still we have some s very small thickness. What could be a solution to unpropped fractures? I know two, but I don't know if you come up with another one. Could you start with small You can do that. You can do that. So th those are called micropropans. And there has been a tendency over time for using smaller and smaller propant. So like, you know, uh, below mesh, uh, what is the name of that mesh? I forgot. Um, 200 or 100 or so. So in the order of tens of microns of propant or even smaller, like sealed size propant. Because that has less chances of getting a uh, screen uh, out of the, of the fracture. And there is another one that uh, at least I know. What does a zipper frac do? Zipper frac avoids stress shadows. Okay. We didn't talk much about that, but basically you put two fractures very far away, so there is no stress interference, and then you put another one in the middle, mm -hmm. or usually in another well, okay. so that um, the one that grows in the middle, it's a uh, the stresses that the two of them already grown put on that on the rock is compensated from two sides and then you grow one in the middle. In theory, they would not have that problem. All right, so any, any suggestion? If you cannot prop a fracture, what you can do? This is actually done actually a lot for carbonates. You can use acid. So you acidize the fracture. And in that way, when you do uh, acidizing, you can etch the surface of the fracture so that you still have some conductivity as the fracture closes, but it's not through propane, it's through channels uh, within the fracture. And I know that uh, many companies have tried this. Still, re results are not overwhelmingly positive. I believe that it, this is a good solution. All right, so uh, then we have one part of the problem uh, more or less solved. You can also land somewhere over here where you have, you believe that you have done a hydraulic fracturing job and uh, that it was terrible because you don't see any, any induced uh, micro seismicity, but uh, then you look at the production and you're producing a lot. Do you know why we could have something like that? Well, that could be a reason, but, but that would also produce seismicity, right, in principle. Depends on the rock, but. But let you know. Let us assume that we we go to a place where there are no, no fractures to begin with, or I mean, there are just natural fractures, the same as here. This is actually a difficult one, guys. So I'm going to tell you, this is something which is called. A seismic. Slip. And what that means is that you can reactivate the fracture, but it will not produce seismicity. Or if it produces, it will produce very little. But it's not going to release this enormous amount of energy uh, when it reactivates. And let's see what is the reason for that. 
this is very common. Uh, it's a very common problem in in seismicity and in seismic uh, uh, studies because depending on the properties of the fault, you may have an earthquake or not. And it is more or less like this. Usually what you do in this type of experiments is you measure what is the friction coefficient as a function of the amount of shear slip. So what we are doing in this experiment is we have two parts of a rock and we do a test. This is called a direct shear test. Uh, of course, you have here a, a normal stress. And you measure what is the friction coefficient. And what you try to do is to measure the properties of that interface. And the experiment consists on doing this shear at a given velocity, B1, usually small velocity, uh, compared to, for example, what would be the velocity that you have for failing a material in natural conditions, uh, let's say, I don't know, millimeter per year, some, something very small. And then after you get to that point, you ramp up the velocity with the velocity two larger than velocity one. And usually what you observe is that the upper end friction coefficient goes up and then goes down. So let me put titles here. What you think about what's going on in there? All right. So in this case, we observe that the friction coefficient, as we increase the velocity from V1 to V2, after going to this peak, it's lower than before. And in that case, we say that this kind of material is velocity weakening because as you increase the velocity, the apparent friction coefficient gets smaller. Uh, usually, with these plots, you uh, measure the distance from here to there, to the peak, and from the peak to the dynamic a region at V2, and when B is larger than A, then this is the velocity weakened, and this results in seismic slip or in release of energy uh, during reactivation. Why? Because the bigger the velocity, the weaker it gets, and the weaker it gets, the more energy you release. So this is sort of an unstable process because as soon as you start increasing the velocity, then you get into unstable condition because it's every time weaker and weaker. That's why this propagation can go for a long distance and uh, it's going to release a lot of energy because it's a naturally uh, unstable uh, process. On the other hand, you have some other rocks and some other uh, fault gouges that you can start at a V1 and then friction coefficient as you change it right away probably is going to increase, but then it will stay into a higher value than before. And in this case, we tell that this material is velocity strengthening. And in this case, 
the distance A is larger than the distance B. And whenever this happens, then you are in sort of in a stable configuration because if you start, if you push the system out of equilibrium, you're going to need every time more and more stress to make it move. So this one is not going to go that far. It's not going to release that, ma that much energy. And this is going to result in a seismic slip. Can you think of an analogy of things that we have seen before uh, that resemble this type of behavior? The strain harder and the strain weakened. So yeah, it's uh, si similar to that. Um, but in this case, it takes into account strain rate, how the material changes with strain rate. But we could think also of making an analogy that a velocity strengthening material would be similar to a ductile material in which the more stress you put, the stronger it gets. And a velocity weakening material will be similar to a brittle material that goes through a peak and then goes through strain softening. So strain softening, velocity weakening, velocity strengthening, strain hardening. Not exactly the same, but uh, uh, those are uh, similar concepts. So in hydraulic fracturing, you, we can also see some of this uh, seismic uh, slip. And, and so uh, relying completely on induced seismicity, it, it, may not be, uh, it, not be, it may not be enough. So actually, you know, I think there is no one that knows very well how hydraulic fractures look in nature. Microseismic uh, clouds give you an idea more or less of what is the extent of the hydraulic fracture, but it's mostly how far the fluid reached. Uh, but it doesn't tell you what is exactly what is the hydraulic fracture shape. And uh, recently, there have been some studies that try to, uh, to locate and to see how those hydraulic fractures look in nature. And let, let me remember the name of this. HVTS. And let's see what we find over here. OK, this was a project. Let's see if we find some nice images. Not here. Yes, yes, yeah, she's in, in here. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, what was done in this work, let's see if we can open this image. This is a good one. What was done in, in this study was to uh, cord through intervals that were already fractured. And to retrieve those cores that you can see over here, and to see if you could find where the hydraulic fractures were, if there was propane or not, and, uh, and, and what the real hydraulic fracture looks like. And for many people, this was very surprising because uh, they found uh, several hydraulic fractures very close to each other. You can see this is four inch diameter. So here you have hydraulic fractures in space, or uh, I'm not sure these were natural fractures or hydraulic fractures, but, but you had some of those sets, yeah. space. Those, these are all hydraulic? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so by the way, so Bethan is gonna talk about this a lot more in detail on Friday. Uh, <coughs> and these ones were very close to space. And the reasons for that are that maybe some of the natural fractures uh, change the hydraulic fracture uh, shape. So it's not just one single plane of fracture, but it's a multiple stranded fracture with several planes. And the other reason for that is, I don't know if you remember guys from a seminar we had about a month ago, that this could also be the result of uh, 
fracture propagation with a mixture of mode one and mode three, in which a main hydraulic fracture, let's say, goes in this direction, but then if it finds a rotation of the principal stresses, it's going to segment into several fractures closely spaced. Uh, and uh, because they have a component of shear. And I think that's the only way you can explain that because from what we have seen, for example, with uh, stress shadows, there is no way you could have a fracture so close to each other. But, you know, again, uh, there's, I think there's still a lot of to see, to understand, and that's why there is going to be a second phase of this project and uh, in which I'm involved and Bethany is also involved with, uh, um, with Dr. Julia Gale from the Bureau of Economic Geology. All right, so we're gonna hear more about this uh, from, from Bethany on Friday. Let's see where we stay. So you know you have a lot of pressure, Bethany, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> to deliver a good presentation. Uh, let me come back over here. Uh, there is one other thing that could be contributing to some of these uh, complex natural fracture uh, geometry. And that's something called subcritical fracture propagation. If you remember, we talked about fracture toughness. And if I plot here in the x-axis intensity factor, let's do it for uh, open mode uh, fracture, there is going to be a critical intensity factor, which is going to be the toughness for which we say the fracture is going, the, the rock is going to fracture. All right, well, it's a little bit more, um, more difficult than that, or more complex, how fractures break. It turns out that we can also here take into account the velocity of propagation. So when you approach the toughness value, the velocity of propagation increases very quickly. And that's what, you know, when we broke, for example, the, the chopsticks, when you get to that value, the fracture propagates very quickly. For some of these tests, if you want to measure how the fracture propagates, you, you have to buy these very expensive slow motion cameras, like they are like $10,000, uh, in order to see and to track how the fracture will propagate. So it's very quick. However, you could also propagate some of these fractures at the lower value than the toughness value. And that's what is called subcritical fracture propagation. Uh, the velocity of propagation can be uh, fitted to an equation in which it is a power law uh, with respect to the intensity factor. So the lower the intensity factor, the lower the velocity is going to be. And you could have, for example, let's think about a fracture over here. And uh, just to make it easier, instead of pressure, let's apply a shear stress here. And, and it should go in the other way. Like that. If you apply a shear, but you do not get to the fracture toughness, but to a fracture lower than that, uh, you could extend. Let me try to see how this is. So this should grow. I'm trying to think which way it's going to go because it could go like this or it could go like that. Um, 
thing it should go. Okay, let's do it like this way. So that's going to be the, the new fracture. And it's going to grow uh, even without the, the presence of fluid, but if you have fluid, it could also grow. Uh, but it's going to grow when you alter the state of the stress. And in this case of hydraulic fracturing, also you could have changes of stresses as the fracture propagate and changes the stresses nearby uh, that could change the state of the stress and could increase intensity factor at fracture tips that make some of those fractures to propagate uh, in subcritical mode. And the closer you get to the intensity, the more these fractures are going to propagate. And, you know, again, uh, here we're just doing mode one, but it's also valid for mode uh, two, which is the one that we did. Uh, well, this one is mode three, actually. Mode three uh, for the one uh, we did in here. And everything in this region is going to be subcritical fracture propagation. This phenomenon of, of subcritical fracture propagation is very important uh, for hydraulic fracturing operation, but it's also super important for understanding the natural uh, fracture patterns in rock that happen over uh, millions of, of, of years. Over millions of years, you can have enough time that you can afford to have fracture propagation at relatively low velocities that are the ones that will make hydraulic fracture patterns and fracture joints that we can see in the in the subsurface. And I think you want to talk about that, Stephanie? No? Maybe Rodrigo? I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't have anything on the state of the fracture where I'm okay. having a spatial pattern. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, with this, uh, I'd like to finish the part of hydraulic fracturing of, uh, of stiff rocks or well-cemented rocks. I'd like to talk very briefly about hydraulic fracture, fracturing in uncemented media. Basically, uh, hydraulic fracturing in sands. So today it's a lot more popular uh, to talk about hydraulic fracturing in shales, but uh, some time ago, um, but still today, there is a lot of hydraulic fracturing uh, done in, uh, in sands uh, for uh, completion purposes, for example, to, to do a frag pack or for, uh, or for just understanding how natural hydraulic fractures could also uh, propagate in, um, in uncemented media. And the problem with this type of, of media, of uncemented or unconsolidated media, is that you don't have any, any tensile strength. Tensile strength is equal to zero. You don't have any toughness. And because of that, that you don't have any, any toughness, you cannot apply linear elastic fracture mechanics because your assumption with linear elastic fracture mechanics is that you can hold the tension at the tip. But in this case, that's not the case. 
And so what, what do you do then? Uh, well, you have to use another type of model that accounts for how these unsemented media fail uh, when you do uh, fluid even fractures in it. So if there is no tensor fracture, how are these materials going to fail? So let's come back to our QP diagram where there is no tensor strength. So the yield function, it starts uh, somewhere over here at, at zero. And we have here our yield line with slope m. And let's say that at some point we are somewhere over here. And we are trying to understand how you would uh, create a fracture in a medium uh, which is made out of, of sand. All right, so if there is no tensor failure, because you cannot never get to tension in here, always the, the, the grains have to be either uh, subjected to compression or they have to have an effective stress equal to zero, that means that this is going to be always failing by shear. When you increase the pressure, then your minimum effective stress is going to decrease and you will go very likely to a, a path, stress path, more or less like this. If you reduce effective stress, then you're gonna get closer to shear failure and your hydraulic fracture is going to look something like this. Let me try to see if I get something more or less realistic but it's going to look something like this. Where, for example, if you're doing a, a frag pack completion, which is to inject relatively large grain size propant into an unconsolidated medium in order to avoid uh, sand production. So here we have small grain sand your hydraulic fracture is going to look more or less like this. So can you think about any reason why you would have these sort of turns on one side and, and on the other? Why it's not planar? And I'm going to show you a real image of this to convince you that this is the case. So if this is not failing uh, by tension, this is not, if it, this is not a clean tension, that means that at some of these tips, actually we have shear failure. If you see over here, every time we go with the decrease of uh, mean effective stress, the only chance that we have is failure in shear. And because we only have failure in shear, then all of this fracture is going to be created by shear failure around the fracture. And yes, you're going to open up something that it's uh, where the two phases are separated, but all around this is going to be all shear. If you were able to measure uh, acoustic emission out of this, you will measure all acoustic emission around this fracture. And uh, let me show you a real picture about that. Okay, let's see if I find it quickly. I think this is the one. 
So in these experiments in the laboratory, uh, here the authors, uh, they injected a, an epoxy into unconsolidated sand into a cell, and this is what they observed. Uh, let me blow this up. Uh, mostly they had fractures that were uh, that propagated in a, in a main direction, but you can see that these are not planar at all. They do have uh, some uh, sort of uh, a main direction, but the direction changes and switch, swi switches from one side uh, to the other. And uh, on the small scale, it's, it's not it's not planar at all. And here you have another example of similar to what I was dr uh, drawing before, where you can see like all these sort of small tips uh, that are failure in shear, and once uh, it fails, it continues to in another direction, it fails again, and goes like twist back and forth. And you can see that very clearly, for example, over here or over here, where it was propagated in this direction, but then it switched into the conjugate direction of shear to go uh, the other way. And I think there is a very good one uh, somewhere over here. This one, ah, this one is my favorite. Where you can see that this hydraulic fracture in an unconsolidated medium uh, is going to be a lot different than a hydraulic fracture in a cemented rock. Okay. Oh no, actually this one was my favorite. So what I like that you remember out of this is that a hydraulic fracture in an uncemented medium is going to be totally different than the one in a cemented rock. What you would expect is, let's say that you have a wellbore. And from this side to this side, this is just a for the sake of comparison, there is no rock like this. But let's say that here you have a shale, here you have a, a sand. A hydraulic fracture in the sand would be short and wide and not very planar. A hydraulic fracture in a shale, because of its stiffness and because of its toughness, is going to be long and, and not very wide at all. Here, you're going to have failure uh, by tension. Uh, here, you're going to have failure by shear. And for example, what I was showing before in that, what I meant with this conjugate direction is that if you have, for example, a shear applied in this direction, where this one is the minimum principal stress and this is the maximum, you will expect the direction of shears to be, the planes of failure to be either in one direction or the conjugate direction. All right, so let me just add one more thing and we'll be done. This is a frack pack, and this is done either to uh, bypass uh, a damaged reservoir zone. Usually, uh, when in reservoir engineering, when, when you talk about damage, you mean about invasion of drilling mud that uh, it's, not, uh, it's not favoring the fluid flow of uh, reservoir fluids into the wellbore. So you want to bypass that damage zone and get into the zone with a high uh, oil or gas saturation so your relative permeabilities are higher. Or you could also do this to avert uh, some production. 
by placing this frag pack with a, a bigger strength of the the propan than the the initial granular medium, you can avoid these uh, small grains to to break and to flow into the wellbore. All right, guys. I think then uh, this is it for me. Uh, remember that you have my, my notes already uploaded for the previous year. So if you're interested in this part about wave propagation, and I know that some of you are very interested in this, uh, you can see here the, the full derivation of the wave equations and the P and S wave velocity from what we have seen before from the Navier's equation, taking into account all the shear and all of that. Uh, so you can check that in there. It's not too long. And uh, let me know if you have uh, any question. So again, on Friday, it's your time. And then on Monday, we have the special lecture. All right? Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Yeah.